Saturday afternoon. Um, apologies for a little technical difficulty. Um, my name's Jeff Krulik, and I, you know, couldn't be more thrilled to be able to put this uh, event together, create a 50th anniversary of the Washington Free, Pe Free Press, a reunion and panel discussion. A little backstory. Um, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, my friend Mark Opsosnik and I, we helped organize a ambassador theater reunion that was part of the DC Historic Studies Conference uh, in uh, 2007, a 40th anniversary reunion. And it was uh, a, a wonderful uh, experience and something uh, that we were able to do and pull together and bring the people who created the ambassador theater dance hall together and meet them, and it's because we were interested. We really wanted to hear the story right from the people who, who did it. And cut to now 10 years later, here we are, and we're doing it once more, and this is with the Washington Free Press. I wasn't around then, and it's a matter of just being really interested and curious uh, and wanting to know the history of this seminal underground newspaper here in Washington, D.C., where I'm from. and. So I would like to welcome to the stage several uh, people who were involved in this publication and to have this conversation and reunion. Uh, first, Art Grossman, where are you? Art Grossman, come up here, please. Frank Speltz, who I haven't met yet, where are you, Frank? Frank Speltz, right here. Uh, Pete Novick, who I have met and I've driven down today. Pete, Peter, uh, oh, here, why don't you come over here, fellas? I'm sorry, there's a... Stairs on the other side, on the right-hand side. Um, come over here. You want to add a couple people? Oh, well, here's the thing. Every, uh, we've got room for seven. It's Frank Speltz, Art Grossman, Pete Novick, um, Marjorie Stamberg, who's here. Um, come on up. Uh, Dick Oaks, where are you? Dick Oaks. Um, Judy Strother Taylor. I haven't met Judy. Hi, Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you. So glad to have you. Oh, good. Um, do we have? Uh... Oh, uh... Where's Bill Bloom? Bill Bloom, right here. Bill and Bill Bloom is our final panelist. Bill Bloom and. Um, I'm gonna, we all, we all have four microphones to share. Pete, Pete, here's your, your lunch, okay? Don't, all right, I'm sorry, I apologize. I didn't bring enough for everybody. Um, I, I would like to take this moment though. Oh, we need another chair. Wait, there's a chair here, Dick. There's a, here you go, sorry. And what, is there somebody, can we put that chair down, Art? Or? Okay, thanks. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, I, I would like to start, though, just by saying that they're very generous in letting us have as much time as we need here uh, to do this, but um, it's supposed to end around 5 o'clock, and we are going afterwards to the closest uh, bar restaurant, which happens to be uh, right, ar right around the corner, 9th and L., uh, to the right, it's uh, called High Velocity. Uh, it's the quietest sports bar I've ever been in. It's part of the Marriott, and it, it, there's a lot of room for us. So that's uh, where we'll be going afterwards to uh, continue. And everybody's welcome. It's open to the public, of course. I guess uh, we don't need this PC. And um, uh, I think, really, I'd like to just start. Um, with having everybody introduce themselves and give a brief intro to what their role was with the Washington Free Press, which started in 1966. Why don't we start with Art Grossman, one of the two founders. Art? Hello. You want to get the microphone close to your face? My name is Art Grossman, and I'm, I'm not 23 anymore. <laughs> so, and, so I didn't look like this. Your, your Art, on? can you grab your mic? Put, hold the mic. There you go. Thanks. And uh, at the time, I was at Howard University studying physics, and I had registered as a conscientious objector. And one night, General Hershey, head of the Selective Service, was speaking to the students at George Washington University, and I spotted Frank Speltz, who's wearing green right now. 
and I recognized him as another Howard student. And afterwards, we went to uh, Tasso's Bar on uh, 17th Street, and we realized, well, none of the white kids at, at GW understood the civil rights movement that we were quite involved with in the, in the 60s, in the mid-60s, and none of the black kids saw the draft coming down. So we said, well, why don't we just recruit two people from each of the universities and put out some kind of newsletter? And you know, we were thinking maybe a mimeograph something, or we didn't know what. But uh, that's what we did, and uh, Free Press was a success. It took off. There had been one previous newspaper prior to the Free Press called The Underground uh, that kind of inspired me. It was, it was more arts-oriented, but it was very local in DC. A fellow named Ed DiBaggio did it, and I think he came out with maybe four issues. And we managed to come out with four issues on our first year before school closed again. And then we started up again when, when school came uh, back uh, in September. Judy? Uh... Well, I'm Judy Taylor, and I live in California now. But in those days, I lived in Washington, D.C. I just gotten out of reform school where I was a guest of the state for two and a half years. And I wanted to do something exciting. And I was walking around the streets of DC and ran into Mike Grossman, who I'm so sorry he's not here with us. And um, everybody was living in communes. And it was just an exciting time. And I had no knowledge of politics and couldn't care less. But um, I had um, a lot of education for the next few years, and I was really on the practical end of things. I just managed the office and went to these meetings that would go on for hours and hours and hours, talking about things I didn't care about, but I, I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Pete Novick, and working in newspapers, especially underground or radical ones, it, it was something I grew up wanting to do because my father was a labor union newspaper man and uh, organizer. And so I grew up wanting to do the same thing. And when I saw the Washington Free Press, I thought, wow, I want to work with these people. And that's just what happened. I walked in and Frank Speltz was the first person I ever saw. And I said, hi, I, I want to work here. And he said, well, start working. And that was pretty <laughs> much it. That summarized the way the attitude was. Anybody was welcome, just contributed but you could, you know. Uh, and it was the nicest group of people I, I've ever met. I mean, how many people do you know 50 years later, and you might only see them a few times in the interlude, then you pick up where you left off. Um, it, yeah, very good people to work with. Thank you. Bill? Uh, uh, is this on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I had contact with the free press, I was working for the State Department as, as a... Uh, computer programmer, and, but, but active in, in the anti-war movement at the same time, which for some reason bothered the people at the, at the State Department. Uh, and they finally told me I have to leave. And I left this, my job at, at State on a Friday in March of 67. And on Monday, I went to work full time at the Free Press. So that was a bit of a change. It was also a bit of a cut in my salary. So. <laughs> uh, but that, my, my association with the State Department uh, caused many people on the left to, to wonder about me. But I think over the years, I was able to satisfy their, their worries. Uh, and, but I'm, one thing I'm so grateful for, I began my career as a writer at the Free Press. Uh, and I now have five books out, one of which is a memoir, which, uh, which includes uh, quite a bit about my time at the Free Press. It's called West Block Dissident, the book is, as opposed to an East Block Dissident, which is, I, was, I was a West Block Dissident. Uh, and, and now I, I send out a, a, a monthly newsletter on the internet called the Anti-Empire Report. Uh, and if you want to subscribe to that, you just send me an email. Uh, 
Anyhow, that's, that's my story. Marjorie Stamberg? <laughs> well, I came to Washington, D.C. I had um, just graduated college at the University of Michigan with a degree in anthropology, and I had gotten a job at the National Geographic Society. Um, but the main thing about my college years is that I was in SDS at the time of the Vietnam War and was at the first teach-in against the war. I still have those pictures somewhere. So when I got to Washington, I think I worked at that job for maybe a week, and I was in DuPont Circle, and somebody came up and sold me a copy of the Washington Free Press, and it was people who were in SDS, people who were in SNCC at Howard. Um, I ran into also, um, uh, I think on the weekend, two women, Sheila Ryan and Marta Cusick, and they were on weekend work release from jail because they had gone into the White House in 1965 and started singing freedom songs, and Lady Bird had them arrested because she said that uh, uh, her girls couldn't do their homework because they were so loud singing freedom songs. So they were part of our group too, and that kind of gives you a flavor of, uh, it was both civil rights and the emergence of the Black Power Movement, because Stokely was down here, and SDS, and um, I just dug in and started to work on the paper full time, and it was, for me, I guess a formative experience in my life, and when the panel comes around again, I was thinking about it, I just want to tell two stories at a certain point point here, one, two of the most important days in my life were October 21st, 1967, which was the March on the Pentagon, and the other one was April 4th, 1968, when we had the ghetto uprising after the assassination of Martin Luther King, and I, I guess I had the privilege of being on the Washington Free Press and being able to cover those uh, hugely important historical events, and um, I, I maybe get a chance to talk a little bit more about what they meant to me. So that experience, as I think a revolutionary, I'm, I'm still that way. I'm 50 years later, I'm a teacher in New York, I'm a union delegate in the United Federation of Teachers, and I'm a Trotskyist in the Internationalist group, and we have a new paper called The Internationalist. So um, I can just say, it's pretty much a continuity. Thank you. Here you go. Uh, no, go ahead, take that one. This is Frank Speltz, who co-founded the paper with Art. Yes, I, I was uh, from a different background than everybody else that you have heard so far, but that was the beauty of the free press. We didn't care about your background. We cared about, did you want to be with us, and did you have something to help you know, make the paper better. And my, my background was, uh, I was a Catholic seminarian. I, I went to um, Catholic seminary out of, high, out of uh, grade school and uh, ended up at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. for studying theology. And I started uh, going out on Saturday afternoons to help at a, at a black Catholic parish in, in uh, Southeast Washington, Holy Comforter. And one weekend we went on a demonstration against a apartment building that didn't rent to black people. And that led to me getting kicked out of the seminary. Well, uh, I had been the editor of my high school and college newspapers. And I just always had journalism in my blood. So that was one, one aspect of my background that I brought to the idea of the free press. The second thing was, because I was a Catholic seminarian, whenever I had free weekends in Washington, I, I took the train up to New York and worked with Dorothy Day at the Catholic Worker. And she's a, currently being uh, checked out to be a saint in the Catholic Church, one of the most radical people I've ever, ever met. And she taught me a lot about, you know, starting at the bottom, reaching out to the person next to you, helping 
the least of our brethren and so on. And Tom Cornell was her right-hand man and he was a draft counselor. And I was just coming out of the seminary I suddenly got reclassified 1A. I wanted to know how to, I, I wasn't a killer. I didn't know what to do. So Tom helped me write my long theological treatise to the draft board. And somehow I was able to get my conscientious objector status. And in the process, Tom taught me how to be a draft counselor. So by the time that I got to the free press, I invented a column called Dear General Mars Bars, which was like Dear Ann Landers, only it was a takeoff on General Hershey because he was the head of, of you know. And Judy Taylor was my confidant on that, my, my co-conspirator, and she, her name was Joy Allman. <laughs> and she a lot of times would get that mail. I started getting a lot of mail because my column got syndicated around a lot of underground newspapers. Started getting a lot of mail, then I started getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of visitors. Got to be pretty hectic. Um, but anyway, that was a, a real service that we provided to the reader. One last thing, in the economics of the free press, we paid everybody $15 a week if they were full time. Except my wife and I and our newborn baby, uh, Jimmy, uh, we got 25 a week because we were a family. And uh, Jimmy, by the way, was the very first interracial adoption in Washington, D.C., after a long battle with the Johnson administration, who had just signed the Civil Rights Amendment, or Civil Rights Bill, but didn't really want interracial adoptions in D.C. So we had that battle, and uh, uh, that, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. One last thing, I'm being a hog of the microphone. We were also a runaway Mecca. Yeah. We had hundreds of runaway teenagers coming to us for safety and shelter. And our favorite was Thomas Loves You. I don't know if you remember him. He's on the masthead of a lot of the issues. He came in, I think he was maybe 14, I don't know, very young, but he had a, a he had cojones, I'll tell you. And he stayed with us for a long time. He lived in our commune, he helped us with the paper, and we protected him from his abusive parents. So, but that was an interesting, interesting side of the free press. I don't know. No, I don't know. Hello. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dick. Sorry. My name is uh, Dick Oaks. I live in Baltimore. Um, I was arrested 10 times with Congress of Racial Equality integrating restaurants between Baltimore and Washington back in the early 60s. And then I helped organize a Students for Democratic Society chapter at the University of Maryland. When I left there, I worked at NASA, uh, calibrating equipment for satellites. And uh, one day I called in sick. Um, but the next day, the boss saw my picture on the front page of the Washington Post being dragged out of the State Department protesting the war. I told him, I, I was sick, sick of the war. <laughs> but uh, then I got a job at the uh, IBM Federal Systems Division in Gaithersburg under an Air Force intelligence contract. Uh, back in those days before computers, uh, it takes a whole year to get the security clearance because of the backlog. And so I, uh, they put me to work along with <clears throat> other former members of SDS. And uh, what we did for a month was teach all the other classifiers in this intelligence gathering system how to misclassify all the other information. And so finally they figured out after a month that all our work and the rest of the crew's work was bogus and so they fired all of us. And at that point I, uh, um, I had a printing press because when, in SDS we had to print into war material. So I took my printing press. Uh, after I got kicked out, the press was kicked out of St. Stephen's Church because we printed anti-war literature in the vernacular of uh, inner city kids. And uh, the board of the church took issue with the four letter words and they kicked us out. So they squeezed the press into 
the uh, Washington Free Press office, which was on the second floor of a place, and we, I had to print all night long because the printer, the Free Press staff was working during the day, so I had to sleep during the day and print all night other literature. I didn't print the Free Press, I printed other literature, anti-war literature and civil rights literature. And for um, GIs at Fort Bragg, they used to come up on the weekends and print the uh, GIs against the war newsletters and what have you. So anyway, um, uh, I wrote a few articles in the free press and helped sell them on the streets and uh, at Thomas Circle, where we eventually went to, uh, where the Liberation News Service was on the third floor and my print shop was in the basement and Thomas Love You was my assistant. Oh, really? Oh. Yes. Um, and, uh, Where was that office? We were trying to remember. Where was it? Thomas, Thomas Circle. Thomas Circle in Washington. That's what I thought. It was not a house. It was an office building. Yeah, it's no longer there. Uh, but I was there when uh, MLK got assassinated, and there was a Safeway two blocks away. We, yeah. we joined the crowd. But anyway, I will stop there. I, I want to say something. Uh, I, we'll have a lot a chance for everybody to talk uh, uh, some more. I wanted you to meet everybody who was here on the panel. Uh, there's other people here, of course, who were uh, attending, who were uh, very involved in the in the paper and in the the, the time period. I, I would like to Art now. You and Frank, uh, when you met and uh, decided to make this uh, paper uh, dedicated towards the, the 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 campuses here, the university students. Um, you were both attending Howard, but you didn't know how to make a newspaper, right? I didn't know anything about how to make a newspaper. All I knew was how to read a newspaper. And I, I went to Tony Gittins, who's over Yeah, Tony Gittins right here. here. Uh, you, and, you were a, a student uh, he, uh, with... He, he was the editor of the Hilltop, which is the Howard newspaper. And he showed me how you put a newspaper together physically, because I had no idea how to do it. And I've always been grateful to Tony because of that. <laughs> and I guess, uh, and you mentioned the underground, which had inspired you, so that you weren't the first underground paper in the area. But, um, and when you actually started, one thing I noticed when I looked at the papers, which I promise I'll be able to show you eventually, was that um, the first couple of issues uh, were, uh, well, this is the, the uh, first four issues. And one thing that I thought was interesting about it um, was that, uh, they were kind of really nicely laid out, you know? They actually had some, uh, you know, they, they just were, looked professional, right? So I thought that was unique, uh, even the masthead. Um, but this was the, there was some press about it. It's got a bi-weekly free press set up on uh, six campuses. So you were getting some coverage and you did have press releases that were sent out. But um, what happened? You only lasted four issues, is that correct? Because they evolved the letterpress, but there was no other way to do it. Pete, you got to talk into the microphone. Oh, can, Frank, can you pass that one uh, microphone? I was going to explain the format, and that's because those new early free presses evolved from newspapers that were printed by letterpress. In other words, there were no, it wasn't photographed and then printed like the later free presses. That's why they look like that. That's, you know, you think of a person on a linotype machine typing a story and it's in straight columns. And the first free presses were like that. There was no other way to make a newspaper, most people thought. But then letterpress was that way you could photograph that became. So the paper was, uh, you did the four issues. Um, what happened? And also, were, how many people were working with you at that time? Um, this was in May of. Uh, well, in the spring of 1966, I believe your first issue was uh, in, in March 1966, and it ended May 1966. What happened? Well, uh, of course, then the summer summer hit, and we weren't going to be coming out in the summer. But uh, we also were disappointed in the response. We just didn't make a huge impact, and uh, we someone came from uh, through town from the uh, Los Angeles Free Press. And uh, he heard there was a Washington Free Press, so he wanted to join because he thought we were just like the Los Angeles Free Press. Well, he was very disappointed when he found out that we weren't. And he pushed us hard to try to be like the Los Angeles Free Press, and we thought that was a, 
you know, a big impact newspaper. We, so we, we geared up. I mean, we began to, you know, kind of troll for people that wanted to join us. And the other thing we stopped doing was trying to look like the Washington Post. Back then, it was all straight columns and pictures and so on. And we had people like Pete Novick and, and other artists who, who, came, who came to the paper and began to give us things like this. You know, but how did you start? How, what happened? Did you just the paper ended, and you just then just decided? Was it almost a year later? No, well, we we kept together, but we just we weren't always publishing. But we we had this idea, and and eventually we we geared up again, and and this time we we hit pay dirt. I mean, we really got a huge response yeah. the second time. Yeah. Was everybody right, working wanna... at that point? Was everybody here, was everybody here involved at that point? At the second time around. Right. Yeah. It, it was a uh, school intercollegiate newspaper, so when school ended, there was no purpose of publishing it. But then the second year, when it took off, then we couldn't stop publishing. Did you have a regular route, uh, run? Was it uh, a regular schedule? <laughs> regular is kind That's of pushing. <laughs> yeah, we is. had goals. <laughs> Well, describe that. I know you had meetings. One interesting thing, Frank, I think you told me was that, um, that at the meetings that you did, um, that anybody had a vote. Anybody could participate. Okay, what was that? Um, it was participatory democracy. This was something that SDS made, made I think, very conscious, us uh, conscious of, that if you're in the, in the building, you're doing the work, you're attending the meeting, by God, you get a vote. If you may have only walked in the front door, but that didn't make you an inferior person. That just, you know, it, 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 and, and so people like that. They could come in and, and, and as Pete said, you could start working right away. There was no, no waiting period. And boy, I tell you, that energy that started flowing through that building was amazing. It really was. What was at your peak? What was the publication run? How many issues were you putting out? How, how many? Well, it, it was a weekly which came out every 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> if we had the money. Well, that's interesting, the money. Can you talk? I would like to know, uh, can everybody raise your hand or stand up if you worked on the newspaper in the, uh, here? How, uh, Richard Harrington? And uh, right there? Eddie Bennett. Eddie and, 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 and Janet, is that it? Henry, and you came from? Uh, we, we worked the paper from uh, 1968 to 1969. Yeah. And you came from? We lived there through the little Mickey boarding house in front of the Cairo Hotel. And you traveled here from New Mexico, right? But you literally flew here at, from New Mexico. Is, no, I'm sorry. Yes, we did fly in. You live here. <laughs> Would you, but you were street vendors? Is this uh, one thing? Is there anybody here who were, you worked on the staff? Was anybody here? We're together. We're still together. I'm amazed. That's very good. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> After all these years, that's pretty good. <laughs> no, I knew you all real yeah, well. We saw, that's how we got paid. We got paid in newspapers. Yeah. yeah. You could, you could get it, the newspapers for free, and then you could sell the papers, and then you could live that way. But to your question, 22,000, I think, was our biggest. 22,000 was the biggest run. So describe that process here. Uh, in the back, I think, there is Jim True back there. Jim's back, back who also worked uh, with you on the, on the paper. Um, and is John you. Hagerhorst here? He's coming. Oh, He's coming. Who's Perfect. coming? Oh, John Hagerhorst, another staff person. <laughs> anyway, um, so really, take us so in, 60, in 1967. Would you say that's when it hit stride, maybe, as the uh, as the paper that you we all know now as the Washington Free Press? Yeah, I'd say the first four issues was kind of practice, <laughs> and then the following issues was more practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would like you to, uh, um, I, I do have something here. Um, 
that I thought was interesting. You, you mentioned in the, in the uh, newspaper about the Washington, the, the Coca-Cola uh, issue. Uh, you had your, your, your group meetings and I guess issues came up. This is the, and Art has kept all of his files. He's got all of his records uh, at many, many of the newspapers, which is really just a great you know, thing that he's been able to do. And, and he shared them with me and he's actually uh, allowed me to scan some and look at them. And I found this, which I thought was really interesting. It was the, uh, the board meeting notes uh, from the meeting in September, I mean, rather in 67, um, fuck Coke. Uh, typewriter, Art will get the executive paste up room, there will be more security in the paste up room. Ann's phone calls, people who get calls at the office for Ann should, anyway, food. Uh, this is food for trips. All of those who will be going to Allen's farm to raise chickens should provide their own food. Uh, place for board meeting, we will meet at Ann's house all the time, but no buts about it, but, but, but. Um, Coke ads eat shit, and we will have none of them. Refreshments. Coke will be served at all board meetings. <laughs> so, so it, it, I guess explain some more of this. So take us through some of that. What was going on? Well, first of all, this is, these are corporate minutes uh, in, in a new and, and uh, creative way. But I just want to draw you one other attention here. Uh, it says uh, F spelt. People must work. So I was I was kind of the one of the office uh, administrators, and I used to get a little upset when people would lay around, you know, kind of, you know, this was a commune where we wanted everybody to be part, but we wanted people to do something and not just, you know, trip or something. And then on the very next line, it says, uh, Frank will arrange for trash removal. And I don't know if that had anything to do with getting rid of the people that weren't working or that was just, <laughs> but anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. Our minutes were always works of art. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mar Marjorie, go, yes. Just not on that, but... Oh, thanks. Um, actually, I want to make two points, but when Dick was talking about the Safeway across the street from um, Three Thomas Circle, I was thinking about that um, when I came down, and I, I have a picture someplace that I have to find of us sharing the materials and foods that were liberated from the Safeway. But I was thinking, I, I think April 4th and being on the Free Press was really one of the most formative days of my political life and I wanted to tell you why. Because um, I'm a Marxist and we know, what is the state? The Marxist understanding of the state is that it's armed bodies of men in support of a certain system, the capitalist system. So here, we have the armed bodies of men, which was the um, 82nd Airborne that came in after the ghetto exploded in all of its righteous rage and anger after two assassinations, really. First, the assassination of Malcolm X, and then the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, but there were, about, I think, maybe 36, 48 hours between when the cops ran away, and I remember sitting on outside Three Thomas Circle and watching the cops fearing the anger of the black population getting in their squad cars and leaving, putting televisions in the back of their <laughs> cars on their way out of, of town. But there was about those 36 hours between when the cops left and when they brought in the 82nd Airborne, and there was no state power, and there was also no scarcity, if you get my meaning, because food was free, shoes were free for the take, everything that people needed, and, uh, and uh, anything. And those 36 hours was the most communal feeling that I have ever felt, because everybody on the block, everybody in Washington, not bureaucratic Washington that left in droves, but those of us who lived there, shared food, shared beer, shared lives, shared everything. And so it's just a little vision of the future that, that stayed with me. And then, of course, the 82nd Airborne came in with all of its brutality and its reimposition of its racist occupation of the ghetto. But I, 
have that picture somewhere of us um, celebrating the liberated Safeway. So it's just a wonderful memory. Speaking of that, Dick Oakes, I think, probably remembers that Free Press did a lot of the printing for SNCC and for CORE and a lot of other uh, civil rights groups during the, the, the uh, uprising. And we, we were indispensable to them because they really didn't have a printing operation sophisticated like, like Dick had. And you worked around the clock, didn't you, for the? Pretty much. Uh, after uh, the um, Free Press stopped, uh, I uh, set up a print shop for the DC branch of the Black Panther Party that started at, uh, after the assassination of Fred Hampton in Chicago and Mark Clark and uh, the uh, National Coalition to Combat Fascism uh, started, and then the Black Panther Party, DC branch, came out of that, and uh, I lived with the Panthers on 18th Street at the headquarters and ran the print shop there uh, for about a year in the late 60s. Um, so the print shop has been going. In fact, I, I, I'm retired from printing now because uh, a digital, Computers have put us out of business, but um, up until the year 2000, I had a, my own printing business in Baltimore, printing for all the nonprofits and revolutionary groups and what have you. I, I guess uh, uh, a couple more talking points, and then we can open it up for some questions. Um, I, in some of the research I did, is it true that J. Edgar Hoover had a subscription? Yeah. J. Edgar Hoover got the paper. He didn't pay for it. It was it was given to him. <laughs> we we made sure we sent him a copy every time. No, okay. What what's the story? He sent his chauffeur. He sent his chauffeur over with a with a federal government check, and and uh, I don't. One part of me thinks we cashed it because we were desperate for money. Another part of me thinks we kept it because it was such a great souvenir. But I think they were afraid of having some sort of a bureaucratic snafu if they didn't pay for it. But they did, uh, they did pay for it. I think they did anyway. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, Dan, is it true Carl Bernstein used to come by the office looking for story ideas? Yeah. When, 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 when the Free Press folded in 1970, Carl Bernstein interviewed me uh, uh, about the paper. It was a very long interview. And when it came out, I was shocked to see that not one word which, which he was quoting came out of my mouth. He, he, he had been interviewing other people as well, and he was quoting them and was saying it was me. I, didn't, I wasn't upset because there was nothing he said, n n nothing he put in my mouth which I, I was opposed to, but it was pretty sloppy journalism. Uh, Bill, uh, since you're uh, mentioning, I, I was going to ask you, um, uh, you came from the State Department, so it was maybe more of a button-down uh, world of uh, uh, daily employment or have you. Uh, was, was there, were you like the intermediary or, or did you set up meetings on Capitol Hill with congressmen, uh, like they wanted to meet a hippie or um, was that? Is that a question? I guess so. <laughs> Not really. I don't know. I was putting. Uh, no, I, it was. Uh, Frank, this was another thing that I guess was mentioned that perhaps there was a meeting set up with congressmen to. Well, I had a friend, a childhood friend from Brooklyn who became a congressman. And he, he and I, and when, I, when I, I, I heard about this, I called him up and he invited me to have lunch with him in the congressional cafeteria. And we sat down to talk and eat, eat lunch. And of course, we, we, we had a big argument about the war in Vietnam and, and other issues. And, and my voice was being raised too much. It was very embarrassing for him. He was surrounded by his colleagues. And, 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 and this, he was sitting with some crazy guy sp speaking about the war. Uh, and we, we parted, but I never saw him again. But then he was, he was he lost his seat in Congress because of some corruption uh, quite soon after that. You were sitting with a crazy guy. <laughs> now, now um, uh, Pete, you took on the name Fuman Zybar. Um, and uh, to describe what that was for everybody. And, uh, I wanted to uh, into the microphone. 
I wanted to write something that was honest and true about drugs since there was so much, a vast amount of propaganda. So I decided to do that, but I didn't want to be responsible for 90 or 100 people taking something and dying or, you know, tripping out and getting run over by cars. So I didn't want to use my own name because I had no stake in it financially. I wanted to speak as an authoritarian person and I did by you making up a name and I just chose Fumin Zybar. Fumin, you know, it's from the Spanish verb to smoke, uh, fumar, and then that would be the third person singular, like he smokes. And Zybar was the name of a butcher I saw on the side of the truck when I lived in Brooklyn. And I, I like the word, and so I just put them together. <laughs> uh, and I, I guess you had mentioned that you were a kind of a haven for runaways. Uh, people would come here oh, to the sky. Oh, yeah. God, yes. They Can you? 13-year-old girls Marge, in, in did you bikinis, want to... they ran away from the swimming pool. I, I've seen that happen. Usually, you wanted to protect them from the obvious predators or even the traffic. They were really unprepared financially or didn't have any clothes to wear and didn't had never been to Washington, D.C., but had the blind faith that it was going to be okay. And the free press was like a mecca form. There was the only address they knew in D.C. We, we would also, I might add, a, have, a, have, uh, a source of abortions. There was a woman who was very well known in, in, the, in the 60s. Uh, I forget her name. McGinnis? McGinnis, maybe. And she, she, spoke, she spoke at our office on, on Q Street. And I was amazed to see it was more than a full house. The sidewalk was overflowing with people. I had no idea that abortion was such a big issue. Yeah. And, and then, and then we, we ran a story in the, in the paper about her, her talk. And I forget how it happened, but I, I became the contact for that. And I was getting calls at home from women all over the country seeking an abortion. I'm, I mean, this, was, this is not a small thing. Hundreds of women called me over, over the, and I, at the same time, I happened to come across a doctor in, 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 in D.C., a Dr. Vooch. Vooch? Vooch. Vooch. And, and I, I'm, I, I arranged with him that I would refer these women to him. He had an office in Silver Spring, and I, I would, but he, he, was, he was very expensive. He was charging $300 in abortion. This is 1967. That's a lot of money. Uh, and I was sending people to him all the time. And uh, eventually, uh, a, f a friend of mine, a woman some, some of you know, who was on the paper, in fact, she needed an abortion. And I, I went to him, I, I, I told him, I was the father of this child, and would he please give her an abortion? So she got it for nothing. Uh, and anyhow, that's... <laughs> there, yeah, there uh, well, was something interesting. I, I wanted to say that um, so another haven for... I, I don't want to use the runaways, but one of the things that we began was at that... And I'm sort of connected with the, the column, uh, the General Mars Bars and the advice to uh, about the draft were also uh, soldiers who did not want to fight in Vietnam because you know, the enemy is at home, it wasn't the Viet Cong, and they would be um, on their way underground. And um, th that was some of the people that came by, and I think it was part of the original coffee house movement for the troops that didn't want to fight. And later, as you recall, either was it, um, I guess it was Nixon, and then it went on to Reagan, uh, this terrible slander about that, you know, the left would spit on the GIs and on the troops, which was so untrue because we were the ones that would establish a safe haven and coffee shops to give support for those uh, people who had been drafted but who uh, were getting very quickly conscious and, and, and didn't want to fight. So that was another haven. I have something on that also. That they used to, we used to let them sleep in our in our office, the, the deserters. Well, they, that's what their official name was, but we, we felt that they were just converts to, to wisdom and peace. But um, one night, there were a bunch of the Marines were sleeping in there on the second floor, and 
up Clio Fire Escape came somebody, FBI or somebody from the government trying to sneak into our offices and steal something or spy on something. And boy, did they have a interesting confrontation with those, with those Marines and boy, they got, they got out there in a hurry, I'll tell you. That was kind of interesting. And one other thing, if many of you have heard of Seymour Hersh. He was one of our heroes back then because he was an incredible muckraking journalist for the New York Times and several other papers. In the fall of 1978, no, 60, 68 and, 60, and the spring of 69, we were planning a counter inauguration against Nixon. And we were gonna have a counter inaugural parade down 14th Street intersecting with the official inaugural parade at Pennsylvania Avenue. And uh, we had promised people all over the country that if you get to Washington, we'll, we'll put you up. So we had this big Rolodex of hundreds of people in Washington willing to take one or two uh, visitors from out of town and put them up. Well, this made the Nixon inaugural committee very, very nervous. So they hired a couple people from, uh, I think it's Fort Hollibird, it's over by Baltimore, do you? Yeah. Uh, Army Intelligence, I think they were. And uh, they broke into our offices one night and stole that Rolodex with all those addresses of all the people that were gonna put people up. And that was the very first Watergate incident that the uh, Nixon inaugural committee committed. And you can read about it if you can find Seymour Hersh's article in the third time. Nobody did much about it, but, but that's, a, that's a true story. You should mention that after they stole these addresses, they sent phony information to these people just to confuse them and to make them miss, and miss things they, they, they wanted to go to. That's how low the, that's how low the, our opposition was. Can, any, can anyone question why we were opposed to this stupid government? I'd like, I'd like to add one other thing. All these people showed how much they trusted the free press for abortion or for drafting the, uh, the war in Vietnam, drugs, whatever. I mean, it was overwhelming and we had to react, but I thought the free press did a really good job putting them in touch with people who knew more about this. But it's overwhelming when you think of all these people and uh, uh, trust you don't even know you and are hitchhiking to Washington, D.C. just to get the three times a circle. And uh, I think we all did our best, you know, is we learned a lot from that. <laughs> I know there's uh, uh, some of the ads in the paper of, of, of great interest to me. Here's one for a rent party. Um, okay, it says, uh, but, uh, free press rent party. 1736, spring bells, bongos, there's a light show, underground flicks, and uh, before, during, after Joan Baez concert. So there must have been a Joan Baez concert. Um, what I find interesting, you had, obviously had to sustain the paper through ads in many cases as best you could, and the record companies, the major label record companies, all of a sudden you'd find these hand-drawn ads, and then you'd find these, these ads that were, uh, uh, very corporate, or like like you'd find in a major publication provided by the record stones, labels. New stones, they were advertised with this. It was amazing. Here's the one that I thought was interesting. Um, the record labels here. Uh, this was uh, here's one of the ones. This says um, disco file. I guess this is a local uh, a local record store. There's the hangman, I think, down in the left-hand corner. Um, but why don't we, are there some questions from anybody from the audience? We have one microphone here, which might be a, uh, um, if somebody could maybe, is that hooked up? Mark, could you, if anybody would like to ask any questions or say anything, well, we'll continue the panel discussion up here. You mentioned, now, you were, a, a, you were trained in, 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 uh, as, a, as a conscientious, you were trained in high, a draft Draft counselor, excuse me. Um, and that's how the General Mars Bars column started. And then, Judy, you were Almond Joy. Is that what it was? Joy Almond. Joy Almond. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody else explain what this was. What? You know, we used to also get on the buses heading over to, to Fort Holabird where the, the, the 1As had to 
take those buses and go over there for physicals, right? And they left about four or five in the morning from the draft board down in downtown DC. So we used to board those buses because they didn't check to see who was getting on them because they figured nobody that wasn't 1A and <laughs> would want to get on. And we would spend the whole time going over to Baltimore proselytizing, letting them know that there was another alternative besides the draft if you, and, and that led to my getting a lot of business also for, for draft counseling. And then finally they, they figured out we were doing that and started checking who was getting on the bus. That slowed us down a little. Was there, there's a question right here, Richard? Seeing the ad there is kind of reminiscent of a particular time if CBS had that campaign, The Man Can't Bust Our Music, if you remember that one. But the thing I don't remember is even though the free press covered so much stuff, it didn't really have much cultural coverage per se, or music coverage at a time when there was so much music that fit into the counterculture and revolutionary sentiments. So I'm just curious whether that was a reflection on Washington is perhaps not at that time a particularly uh, vivid uh, community for that kind of coverage or if there was any other reason for that. I'd like to address that. Um, the music that was advertised in the free press was unknown to everybody because it was that new. Nobody knew enough to say much more than what this group had done before or where you can hear them on other albums. It was such a massive evolving in an exponential form. Um, we were the closest thing it was to a centralized point of knowledge. And there were people who did record reviews. Suzanne Fields reviewed some movies and, and records. Um, anybody who wanted to could. And uh, it was just in, insane, the amount of good music that went through um, 68 and 69 that was reflected just in the ads and also the list of concerts. The best, I think we did keep up with where you could go to see this performer or what's in what art gallery. I mean, it was a lot there going on, but I think we did better than anyone else and <laughs> at least trying to be a focal point. I think one of the strong points of the paper that hadn't existed prior to this was the calendar of events and that people could look at the paper and know what's going on in town in the counterculture. And I thought that was a very strong mm -hmm. element. Yeah. And, now you were also tied in with the head shops of the can day. I add I'm something? sorry, Judy. The paper did more than just produce a paper. Yeah. It was sort of the, a, a significant element for everything else that was being instigated in the community, the Ambassador Theater, word was out about that, and the people that we now look back and think of as idols from that era, they were performing there every night. Um, I mean, so many of the groups now that are famous, Jimi Hendrix was there, and um, Vanilla Fudge, and Judy Con they were all there. And other things that grew out of there, the Free Press emerged from there, the first half, um, Drug Treatment House grew out of the existence of the free press. Mm -hmm. It's like the Runaway House, the Food Co-op, the Guerrilla Theater House. Um, there were different communes all over the city that were springing up that were taking on specific aspects of the, um, of the community's responsibilities. And it was a really exciting time to just go out and goof around because there was something happening everywhere you turned. And I feel very fortunate to be this old and have <laughs> been part of that. You mentioned the Ambassador Theater. Here's an ad for the Ambassador Theater uh, with the Jimi Hendrix experience uh, and Natty Bumpo in the left-hand corner. And Jimi Hendrix is spelled, well, Hendrix is spelled H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S. But that's a whole nother story. It was very early on when he was just touring. Mark, right here, another question? Michael, Michael Oberman. Yeah, I, uh, I wrote for the Washington Star uh, from 1967 to 73. I was a music columnist, did an interview column, and it's kind of funny that the Star was a conservative newspaper that supported the war in Vietnam, and I was a token hippie who would drive in with my German shepherd dog, who would sit under my desk, I'd write my column and leave. Um, I also managed a counterculture band called Claude Jones. We had a communal farm in Virginia and always longed to write for the Free Press or Quicksilver Times or Unicorn Times, et cetera. 
And occasionally I did, and under pseudonyms, um, the star didn't like it. And eventually in 1973, I, I left the star. But the, the funny thing is they let me alone. I could interview any act I wanted to. And a lot of the acts that I interviewed were acts that were opposed to the war in Vietnam. And uh, that was very unusual for a conservative newspaper. We had a strategy of pigeonholing the, the uh, mailboxes of the Post and the Star and at the time, and I think the news also was still there. And um, then people could see our paper and then say, as quoted in the, in the free press, where, where there was a certain amount of censorship in those, in those establishment presses, they weren't allowed to touch certain areas, but they could report on what we were doing and the word would get out. Uh, I was a cab driver all through the, the days of the free press. A lot of times I'd work all day in the free press and then drive my cab all night. And I'd come back to the office and sleep on my desk until Judy would wake me up to get going. And sometimes Judy would come out and, and drive cab with me. She was, she was very... <laughs> she was a go-go dancer at the time. That was her part-time job. And, but anyway, um, one of the things I would do when I was driving all night was to go into the Star the Daily News and the Post and put a, a free press in each slot. Because back then you had free access to the reporters' cubby boxes or whatever you call them, the pigeonholes. And I put one in every one because I didn't know who was influent. And I tell you, that led to a lot of cross-fertilization between the professional reporters and the free press because they, they, you know, they could follow us from a distance. But then the FBI was following me in my cab and a lot of times I think they wonder, what was I doing in the star that I was in the post? And, you know, uh, but they followed me for about two months everywhere I went. But then I guess they said I was harmless. I don't know. But... Oh, go ahead, Dick. Sorry. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you want to say something, Dick? <clears throat> yes. Uh, the rest of you probably remember this better than me, and you might want to comment on this. But do you remember when the Washington Post went on strike? <laughs> and we came out with a daily... Who, who wants to talk about that? Yeah. We, we came out with a daily for two days. It was, so, <laughs> it was so exhausting. I can't tell you how fatigued we were. <laughs> and I think I might have brought one of those copies in this batch that's here today. The headlines in a second one, every letter was a different font and different size. We were just worn out and running out of that rub off type. <laughs> it was fun, though. Oh, I was just saying you could tell our fatigue because every headline had different font styles and different sizes. We were just desperate to use up the last of the rub off type that was photographed on the, on the flats. This is one of the papers here. Yeah, and in fact, the strike ended uh, just as we yeah. were finishing it. The, the Post, of course, was very frightened by our daily newspaper. <laughs> 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 they, they, they paid us $10,000 to, to stop doing it. <laughs> well, I, I think now, since I'm a union delegate, I would look back on those days a little differently and not be so proud if we had a scab paper going on, I have to tell you, because I, uh, that wouldn't be, I'd have to look at that again, because I remember when um, New York Review of Books uh, came out when, um, Daily News in New York and the New York Times were on strike, and in my mind, it's just always been the scab publication. So, I, hopefully, we're learning. We learned something. Uh, I don't think I'd do that again. Um, one thing I want to say, with, in common, what Judy said that the paper was more than a paper, because I was thinking back at the rent parties. I mean, we needed that money, so we would have a rent party. But that wasn't the whole thing. Those parties were so crowded because everybody wanted to support the paper because it was their community. I'm thinking, and you know I'm a Marxist, but, and, um, you know, Lenin said that the uh, part, that the p press is the organizer of the party, is the collective organizer. Well, we were not a party. We had all different kinds of 
tendencies, political interests, and so forth. However, the fact that the paper came out was an organizer, I think, for the whole movement in Washington, SDS, SNCC, anybody who was against the war. And that's why those parties, people just came because it was their paper. They wanted to support it. And, and my, I don't know if you all have the same re recollection, but in terms of music, I mean, I hear Aretha Franklin in my, my head every time I'm thinking of the music that we were listening to because there were so much of our support was coming from SNCC and Howard and, and the black movement. So that was, you know, a, lo a lot of the music that was there. Marge, I want my, to my earliest oh. memory of you, you had just come back from England yeah. and the Beatles were coming out of your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just couldn't sit still without thinking about the Beatles. <laughs> I also want to emphasize that um, we, we did groundbreaking work in several places. For instance, when Che Guevara was murdered, we were the only paper in DC that really had a full coverage of that. And, and, you know, and, and I give Margie a lot of credit for that because she was you know, really one of our leading theoretical, political kind of uh, uh, reporters. And, and she, she just really educated uh, the counterculture in, in Washington about the real issues involving Che Guevara and, and, and what was going on down there. Uh, another one was the, was the uprising in DC. Um, you know, most of the newspapers were frowning on all this stuff, but we were understanding how to, uh, what, what was really going on there. In fact, there was always an historic close contact and, and, and communication between the African American side of DC and the white side of DC, the suburban side of DC, and there was a place where both, both groups could meet on equal footing, and there was a lot of communication. For instance, we, we broke the story of, uh, this is just gossip column stuff, but when uh, Stokely Carmichael was going to marry Miriam McKeeba, I think it was, we had the, we had the news before the poster or, or any of the gossip columns or anything. We, we had a lot of inside scoops that the Post had to cover and then give us the credit for. So, um, but anyway. Dick, please. Uh, this is very, um, I promise, vigorous discussion. So please grab the microphone among your, you know, Okay. Else, if anybody wants to say anything, just raise your hand. I'd like to say something about the Liberation News Service that we shared uh, the building at Thomas Circle with. They were on the third floor. Two guys from New York, Ray Mungo, and who else? Marshall Bloom came down, and we worked closely with them. They had a teletype machine. They got instant news from the uh, UPS AP on teletype, and we got the, the, the latest news for our paper that way as well. But they serviced underground papers, hundreds of them all across this country. And so that was a very important service that they provided to us and other underground papers. And uh, you might want to say more, I don't know about Liberation News Service or, um, but we have, we have a, uh, did, did you have one question? I'm sorry, Pete, then we'll come back and bring up Circle. Yeah, for, first, I wanna thank Jeff Krulik for pulling this together, Jeff. Thanks very much for, for, for doing this. Thanks, Mark. And I'm wondering if somebody could talk about the end of the paper, the demise of the paper, and perhaps Judge Pugh, and if that, if that was the beginning of the end. I still get worked up about that other dimension. So. Okay, that's a, you know, and we can also, the, if you, anybody else wants to go back to what Dick mentioned about Liberation News Service afterwards, oh, but, well, but, all I want to say we, is we want to, uh, okay, Ray Mungo and uh, Marshall Bloom with, uh, they had a violent argument. Marshall Bloom, Marshall Bloom died when he was very young. He was, it was, he died in, in, he was in his 20s still, or maybe 30. Yeah, he took the possession of the machinery and the rest of the Liberation News Service did not like that. This is right after they left DC to go to New York. It was the Liberation right. News Service was a kind of a, they wanted to be like a, a, a literally a news service for the well, underground. It was, it, that it people was. Under, gotta understand that Washington DC was only one of many American cities with, that spontaneously created an underground paper. It was like, uh, the, the, it was a happening like a, Synchronicity, as Carl Jung would say, and it all happened. And Liberation News Service was like the Associated Press or the United Press Syndicate, you know, that 
distributed news to everybody. And if you would see, no matter what city you're in, the underground press. And you shared office LNS. space with them while they were in Washington, D.C. Yeah, they were in, they were in the building, in the sub-basement. <laughs> no, they were, on the, they were on the top floor. Well, yeah, the press was in the sub-basement. And Ray Mungo is still alive. Yeah, um, he, he and, and I was, I, publishes, he's on online. He wrote a book, when he and I were arrested the night Martin Luther King was shot, and we, he and I and a, another young person were in a, the, a dungeon under the Capitol building that had last been used since the Civil War, and along with everybody else they had grabbed on 14th Street and who was rioting. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, so that, but uh, they were here, uh, now, um, we can circle back. I mean, so, oh, I guess some the of the, the issues. paper ended, I think, there were, Okay, everyone thought that the, the police actively wanted to end the free press. Unfortunately, they took an issue of freedom of the press and turned it into a thing about obscenity, making fun of a, a, a judge on a personal level. By that point, all the adults had left the free press and it was two people from the high school that really were the only ones left. And I thought they were, in, they were the police infiltration. Because if you want to destroy the free press, do it by printing dirty pictures and cartoons about a judge who can ban obscenity because that's the law. Can it somebody bring us, yeah, press. I'm sorry, Pete, I don't mean to just kind of maybe do a thumbnail sketch about what exactly that was because it ties into the harassment I mean, It was all about nothing. It was about a dirty cartoon and the judge took offense. The police used that as an excuse. It, yeah. Yeah. This is the screen. This was on the cover well, of the free press. Some of it. I mean, but it was uh, it was during the engagement. What happened? Which was now um, Art. You left. I think uh, um, you were not around at this point. And I guess there was maybe a fluid set of staff and people. And people could say that they were editors. And in fact, just whatever. I mean, I'm just summarizing based on what I think I, my understanding. And this was in 1969, mm -hmm. and and there was an arrest in Montgomery County, and uh, it wound up in the court with Judge Pugh. They uh, asked for a fight over a stupid desire to. Pete, assault. we need. If anybody would be helped to put talking to the microphone, or uh, does anybody have more they want to share about that? Ex yeah, what I was would, going on I would, I at that thought, time? Uh, the, the cartoon was the, the, the salesmen of the, of the newspaper were brought before Judge Pugh, and uh, they, they uh, made a cartoon, which is being shown now, of him masturbating, and that even exacerbated the problem. So the second issue was a dot-to-dot -dot of the same picture, so you could complete your own. <laughs> The, the American Civil Liberties Union took up their case, and after several years of uh, uh, court filings, the, uh, the people selling the paper won. Uh, the, the government was always so paranoid of the free press. We weren't doing yeah. anything wrong, but the government was so paranoid. Uh, the, the one I like is once we went to the printer, and the printer said, uh, the government was here uh, they don't want me to print this issue that I had brought them. So I, didn't, I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, let me see it. And he looked at it. He said, I'll print it. So what that said is, you know, from the get-go, there was somebody in our office who was the, the FBI. It was identified as the FBI. Uh, they used to just walk in. I mean, we all looked like we looked then. Like we all looked like we looked then, which was, you know, not very formal. And the FBI would walk in, literally with their trench coats on and their hats. And they usually would ask for Dick Oaks, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why, Dick. Maybe you... Uh... But they would ask for Dick or somebody. And no matter who they asked for, I, I always said, because I was in the front office, I always said, I'm sorry, they're not here. And they would say, well, tell so-and-so we came by. And that was one of those times they were looking at the paper before it was... Speaking of freedom of the press, uh, in, I, we were over in the Capitol building one time and we noticed that in the basement there was a whole string of, of newspaper machines, one from every major city in the country with the, the major daily from that. So the congressman could go down and get a newspaper from their hometown or from, from you know, Topeka, Kansas or whatever. So I thought, well, we ought to have a machine in the Capitol, you know? <laughs> so I started working my way through the Capitol bureaucracy, applying for this machine. And all you had to do was, 
you know, you had to provide the machine, you had to put up some sort of like, I don't know, deposit or something, I'm not sure why. You had to do two or three other hoops we jumped through. And all of a sudden, we got, we got a letter that the Capitol had decided to not have those machines in the basement anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wouldn't, we wouldn't be, and, and that lasted until I think we went out of business and then those machines came right back. But it shows you how afraid they were of us that they would do things like that. And I, I want to just say some of these pictures are from the Washington Star. Um, there's a very good website called Washington Spark. Craig Simpson uh, details this case in depth. If you want to go online and just search Washington Post, excuse me, sorry, Washington Press, <laughs> free, Washington Free Press, Judge Pugh, or whatever. It, it, it's, it's really in depth. And uh, there was a question um, over here on the right. Yeah, my name is Cliff Smith. Um, I got radicalized in the summer of 1967, and part of it was the Washington Free Press. I think the issue they did on the Pentagon March was the finest journalism done by anybody on the Pentagon March. I've still got that issue at home. Um, I was not a part of putting together the Washington Free Press, but I was at the uh, Nixon counter inaugural in 69. Um, I, was in, uh, I was a marshal at the Pentagon March. I was in New York City on uh, April 15th, 1967. But at the same time, I was working in State Department at the same time Bill Blum was there, and I was actually writing top secret uh, summary of world events for the Secretary of State and the President of the US at the same time as I was doing my anti-war activities. Eventually, I was kicked out of state for being uh, against the war in Vietnam, and I became a total radical hippie, and later ended up being a Maoist in the Communist Party, marxist leninist uh, led by uh, Michael Klonsky out of the SDS. In the last uh, two, three years, I've been to maybe 10 or 15 Black Lives Matter demonstrations, Palestinian demonstrations, and I think all of us should keep up this work that we started 50, 60 years ago. Thank you. Oh, and one other thing, one other thing that's really important. We talk of the maximum circulation maybe being 20, 23,000 of the Washington Free Press here in DC. During those years, you, when you include the uh, GI newspapers, uh, um, uh, Black Panthers newspapers, all of the stuff nationwide I read where there was somewhere between 20 and 40 million copies every week sent out of underground press of one kind or another. To me, that is nothing small. It is something to be uh, remembered and respected and applauded. Can I? Thank you. This is the Pentagon issue, and um, I just have to uh, so much agree with um, the comrade that just spoke about this, because I, I think it was one of our finest yeah. points as really revolutionary journalists, because this was probably the high point of the anti-war movement to that point when, and this enormous march on the Pentagon, and we were there, and we told the real story, and everybody knows it got picked up by Norman Mailer in the Armies of the Night, and he won a Pulitzer Prize for it, and he is by no means not my favorite author in many ways, but this was what the bourgeois press would not tell you. The Washington, you were not gonna get this in the Washington Post or the Star or the New York Times, but it was, to me, movement journalism at, at its height, and um, yeah, just, um, I. That issue has passed around probably more than any other issue between friends, and it was amazing. I think that's what it was all about. Uh, okay, uh, we have a question back here? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, wait, yeah. Uh, Mark, will pat, you'll get, Mark will bring you the microphone. If you want to have a, have a question or say anything, uh, Mark will bring you the mic. Oh, thank you. I, I don't know if it's come up, but there is a collective of about uh, 10 people working on interviewing activists in Washington, D.C. in the 60s and 70s. We've interviewed Art. Uh, so we've interviewed about 50 people, 45-minute interviews. It's, uh, we have an office at IPS, Institute for Policy Studies, and uh, we'll stop the process in, in a few months. Uh, but uh, if anyone's interested, all the interviews are online. They're going to be archived, or they are being archived, at George Washington University, at uh, the archival part of the library. I, I did want to say, uh, and I guess I have a question about it, 
About 10 years of, uh, ago, there was a reunion of those of us active in SDS, started from 1963 through 69 uh, at the University of Maryland. And I was shocked, shocked, <laughs> to see that most people were no longer political activists. They were into IT and real estate and stuff like that, especially the Maoists. <laughs> So I'm curious how many of you would describe yourself still as uh, political activists uh, very much engaged in the political system today, starting with art? Uh, I, would, I would say no, but I, I rise occasionally for specific events, but not as a day-to-day -day thing. I've actually been spending my last six years sailing in the Mediterranean and seeing the history of the world. Spend half a year uh, in the Mediterranean for the last six years, uh, six months in the Mediterranean. I am. Um, sorry. I help different jurisdictions set up programs for kids that are in trouble, primarily mentoring initiatives, and I also have a nonprofit organization. This is very political, a nonprofit organization to stop the euthanasia movement of our pets. Our cats and dogs, and for each of you, I have a free kitten as you leave here today. Um, as a chemist, I wrote many articles dealing with pollution, which was a topic that I knew very little about. Most people didn't care much about in the 60s, and they were te extremely technical reports, just reports of scientific uh, chemical nature to the EPA to explain their Superfund sites. And the very act of just printing those things was kind of radicalizing to people who discovered that every nuclear power plant has dozens or hundreds of barrels that are just rusting away because there's nowhere to put it. And that's just one of many thousands of dangerous and strange chemicals in your backyard. Um, I, I thought there ought to be a scientific underground newspaper today it's from working with what I was working with. Um, it would be very interesting for people. <laughs> My activism for many years has been mainly as a writer and speaker uh, on campuses and, and abroad. I've spoken in, in Europe uh, many times. Um, and I now send out a monthly newsletter called the Anti-Empire Report on the internet. It's free. Just send me an email. Uh, yeah, Marjorie? Yeah, um, I guess for all the FBI people who are still following us around in this room, I, I'm a card-carrying communist and, and have been and still proudly am. Um, I am a member of um, the Internationalist Group League for the Fourth International. Uh, when I was in Washington, I saw myself as an SDS movement person, and as I explained some of the experiences, the march on the Pentagon, uh, the protests that we had after the assassination of Dr. King were formative experiences in my life. Since then, I've become much more of a scientific socialist and a Trotskyist uh, because the two tenets of, uh, of Marxism that Trotsky espoused are the ones that um, are a political guide to me. One is that um, we can't have uh, socialism in one country. It's a worldwide movement. And second of all, that the working class itself is going to be the motor force of change. These are the people that can shut down society and can really stop the wheels of capitalism. And for us right now, uh, a lot of our work is in uh, the defense of the very large um, immigrant workforce uh, in the United States that are undocumented, that come without rights, but come from experiences that are uh, make them very, very brave and very class conscious. And especially now in the period where we have this election uh, with the um, xenophobic, racist, chauvinist pig Trump and his wall versus Hillary Clinton, um, the darling of Wall Street, who is most likely to get us into a warmongering war with Russia, I think um, that that work in defense of immigrants, um, both here and what's going on in Europe, is, is a lot of the focus of our work.
but a lot of what I am now, I think, was formed uh, by my years here. Frank here. Margie always tells it like it is, I'll tell you. Uh, I wouldn't really call myself you know, active in anything other than you know, the traditional you know, trying to get out the vote for Hillary right now. I know that's probably not too popular in this room, but probably better than getting out the vote for Trump. <laughs> But um, no, I, I really am not on a cutting edge of any sort of movement right now. My political work uh, is in two areas. I'm a singer songwriter and I've written uh, several songs. You can go onto my website and see it. I have some lyrics here, which I would be glad to share people with people. But I also vote in the street as much as I can. Uh, I was uh, arrested a couple months ago <clears throat> with my neck locked to the door of the Japanese embassy in support of the Japanese workers opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I was arrested at Senator Schumer's office against drones. Uh, so uh, I uh, vote in the street as much as I can. Uh, we have some qu more questions. Mark, right here. Mark, why don't you just follow I, the microphone? I got two, two quick ones and easy trying to figure out or visualize your office. Did you have a real designated telephone? Did you have a designated telephone operator Why, when you were in your prime? That's number one. Number two, did you pay your telephone bill? <laughs> the question was, uh, did you have a telephone operator if, they, answer, if they, they called the office? Somebody, if somebody answered the phone, was that it? Yes, who answered the phones? <laughs> Judy answered the phones. If you, now how did you pay the phone bill? Who is that the other question? Frank handled that. Frank handled that? He wrote the checks. Um, okay. Pay, uh, I, did more than that. She wasn't just a phone answer. That's oh, yeah. That's for sure. Right, right here. The, the, Okay. Um, I, I, I find you also very interesting and in that you stood up and you spoke out at that time. Um, two years ago, this time frame, I was in jail. I was jailed from October 22nd to November um, 12th. I was held in solitary confinement for 14 days till 5 o'clock on election day so Senator Mark Warner could be reelected without me exposing emails between himself and I, myself. Um, I'm the ex-wife of the son of a judge. We're jailing people to control them here in the United States. I snuck documents out that got me out of jail. It was illegal to do what they did to me, but the judiciary is so strong. And um, like I said, we have 10,000 people and I'm trying to stand up and you know, I've got about 20,000 followers on YouTube. We're doing it a little different than you guys did. But I, I, I think we are still trying to make the same kind of change that you guys did. And you don't understand it until it happens to you. And I just really admire you guys for um, coming together like this and talking about it. So thank you. Thank, thank you, and, and uh, we also are just we'll be, we'll be working with the library, the Washingtoniana room, to digitize the run, uh, well, to present the run. So just there's a whole presence. We're going to ha establish a, a portal to preserve this history. This is not the end of this. In fact, it might be the beginning. Oh, Joni. Could you explain the economics a little? Like, how much did it cost to put out the paper, the run, how much money did you have to have to actually put something out? I, I could answer that. We, we always had fundraisers. Uh, the minimum you'd want to be printing would be 10,000 because it, the first copy was the same cost as the 10,000th copy. And I always thought in terms of about $300. If we got a full page ad from a record company, that would put color in the paper. Um, the, the staff, if you worked on the paper, you could go to the street and sell it for 20 cents and keep the whole 20 cents. 25 cents. No, 25 cents out of town, 20 cents on the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, you, if, you, if you vended the paper, you kept half of it. Uh, so the money, if, if the paper were sold by a vendor, uh, we'd get 10 cents for every 
paper that was sold. Oh yeah, yeah, and we paid we paid our bills, you know. And if we didn't have the money, we didn't buy whatever it was. Uh, and I know one thing: there were a lot of high school students selling this in the high schools. Um, people could sell around the region. It, 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 there's articles about it, and of course the kids uh, tending to be harassed or thrown off the property. I also found it interesting that somebody got arrested in Salisbury, Maryland. There were people selling it in Salisbury, Maryland, so your reach was really, really far and wide. It wasn't just this area. It was regional, statewide even. I have a quick question for Francis. Do is it, did, was I dreaming, or did we have Dun & Bradstreet as our collection agency yeah. for a while? What was the question? The, uh, did, we, did, did you have, we have Dun & Bradstreet helping us collect our debts? Well, yeah, actually, actually we did. We, what happened was we got a, uh, you know, Dun & Bradstreet sent out to all new businesses, you know, if you really want to have good debt collection, you know, hire us to do it for you, you know. So we had a free trial membership for, I think, three months or something. And uh, so we got all these stickers that we could put on our invoices that saying that, you know, D&B, you know, collects our, our, our past dues or whatever. And oh my God, that brought so much attention from like the, 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 the straight press. I and mean, they couldn't believe it. it was like, how would they be using Dun & Bradstreet if they're so anti-establishment, you know? It was, a, it was a kind of a private chuckle that we had on people. Hi, uh, I'm Bill Rice, and I want to thank the whole panel for being as great as you are. Thank you very much. I have a question and uh, a, a comment. My question is, could you elaborate uh, about any infiltration uh, by the authorities? Because it seems to me that would have been relatively easy, and if they were at all smart, very disruptive, but from the way you tell it, they were stupid and inept at it. And, and secondly, you mentioned about Washingtoniana and archiving this discussion and, and uh, su subsequent activities. Uh, I'm uh, working on keeping the Washingtoniana collection uh, accessible during the renovation of MLK. So if you care to see me afterwards, I'll tell you about it. And we can also tell you about the DC archives. Yeah, uh, Dick. Um Sir, I have a question. Thank you for offering to archive the Washington Free Press at GW. Do you also, would you also have a capacity to digitize our issues? Uh, let me just take a, the lead on this. The, if anybody's familiar with Dig DC, it's tied in, Digital DC, it's tied in with the Martin Luther King Library and Washingtoniana collection. Uh, Art has agreed to donate his, the run of the uh, free press that he and Pete have uh, put together to the uh, Washingtoniana uh, room and to their digital DC. It's Dig DC, right? It's online now. You can see the run of the Unicorn Times. I think, Richard, did you have anything to providing them? Right. Also, at Quicksilver, I'm sorry, Quicksilver right. Times. You're, the Quicksilver Times is there. Um, I know we'll have time for a few more questions. I, I'm sorry, I just thought I'd add this, that uh, uh, Dan Heinecker, who I think left, if you see him, he deserves a thanks if you run into him at all, that letting him know that you appreciate he's photographed every, every page of every issue uh, to provide that for the uh, library. And also, um, that's the oral histories that we're gathering uh, will also eventually be affiliated with the library. And, uh, I, I wanted to add something to the previous comment. I don't recall ever hearing any infiltration at the Washington Free Press, but there was infiltration at Quicksilver Times, which I was a part of, um, and Sal Ferreira, who wrote under the name Sal Torrey, was one of the absolute major voices in that paper. And I still haven't been able to prove this, but we understand, in retrospect, that of the 10 or 12 people who worked at Quicksilver Times, five of them were undercover working for the CIA, the FBI, the Metropolitan Police Department, and I don't know what other groups, but almost half the people who were working there. Well, so we, I often wondered if they had their own private staff meetings after the regular <laughs> staff meetings. I mean, you know, it's just such a bizarre. Well, as a matter of fact, the Washingtonian is hopefully I, I writing a story about this. 
I was a, a, a close friend of Sal Ferreira, in fact, his, his closest friend in the city. And I've written about it in my memoir, which I mentioned before, I go into full detail about him and, and his career as a spy. Uh, he's, he's now uh, living in Chicago, uh, but it, it's a very amazing story. And it didn't happen at the free press? Well, not that I, not not of, not of that, not of his character, his caliber. I mean, he was a a full time, in effect, a full time spy for the CIA, and he was he was uh, using me as, as an entree into all kinds of movement meetings in D.C. And I had no idea what, that, that I was being used, and then he eventually moved to Paris where he was spying on Philip Agee, who, whose name many of you must know. Uh, Agee has written about him extensively, and so, so, so have I. I'd like to make a comment about the Quicksilver Times, which was another underground paper. Um, there were people working for it that were in the pay of the government, and it was not an underground paper like ours. It was for profit. The, People, I was sort of friends with the people who started it. They, they lived in the house that we all lived in, and they were doing their own thing for themselves. It, it was a boss and, and, and worker situation. It was not like the free press. And I found Army oh, wow. Intelligence to be the biggest organization of infiltrating the free community. And they were very aggressive and nasty at times, I found. Art? The point is, the government was paranoid, but we weren't doing anything illegal. <laughs> they, they would put obstruction after obstruction. I remember we applied for a second class permit so we could mail our papers out cheap. And uh, the, the local postal would up the ante every time. Well, we didn't have enough this or that or the other. And uh, they were just so paranoid. One day I was walking downtown and I passed uh, the, uh, the federal postal building. So I said, well, let me go in there and so I went in, yes, can I help you? I'd like to see the Postmaster General, please. Well, he's out of town. Would you like to see the Assistant Postmaster General? I said, yeah. So I told him the story of, of what we were going through, and he picked up the phone right there and then, and we got our, we got our second class permit. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the government okay. that was paranoid. Yeah. So they, they were the ones that had to spy on this. And the only thing illegal going on was maybe smoking some pot once. You know, or one, I mean, continuously. I wouldn't say one, once continuously. <laughs> and I didn't smoke cigarettes, so I didn't know how to smoke at the time. I remember uh, some kids said, well, we think you're a spy. Well, me being a mathematician, I said, well, I can't prove I'm not, so just don't do anything illegal in front of me, <laughs> and you don't have anything to worry about. Was there a, a, okay. We have probably time for just a few more questions. Okay. Uh, my name is Jan Norden. I'm with the Internationalist Group and the Trotskyist newspaper that Marjorie uh, mentioned. And also, I would say we've been trying to get our second class mailing permit, but uh, we don't have the same way of getting it that you have today. Um, one th the thing I wanted to comment on is you showed here the slides of the Pentagon issue and also about the Chicago issue. And what that reminded me of is this, um, as a revolutionary journalist, you know, you're very aware of the power of images. And the image of that Pentagon march that has been used over and over and over is of a young woman putting flowers in the guns of the soldiers that were guarding there. That is the way it was presented. And I think that's the way the ruling class likes to use the idea of counterculture. There were the flower children who just wanted to have you know, peace and everything like that. The interesting thing in reading through what was in the Washington Free Press at that time, because I just happened to read the excerpts of Marjorie's article that Norman Mailer did, is that that was not at all the way it was. At that march, the, the Army intelligence and the police made a particular point of arresting and beating up women in particular, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, they were frustrated and they really wanted to take it out against the women. The other thing is they wanted to make the men feel bad that they weren't defending the women. So it's very interesting the way they distorted the whole picture to make it seem very peaceful when in fact it was directed precisely against the young women uh, who were doing that at that time. So I just want to mention that because they're doing the same thing today with Syria. They do it all the time. 
Um, and this is the issue before it. This was the build up. The issue here was prior to that one. The, the issue that we showed earlier was a special that was done for the coverage of the, um, the uh, action. Uh, our, I guess you, um, and Mark, are there how many more questions? There's one more, and then we'll have, um, Art, why don't you say something and then. I would just like to acknowledge John Hagerhorst. I wish he would stand up. He walked into the. John Hagerhorst. He, he walked into the office one day and said, you guys need a distributor and I have a truck. He was hired that <laughs> in 30 seconds. And he made the papers available through all the head shops and various news uh, outlets around the city. Again, farther away than just yeah. downtown. Uh, I'm glad yeah. <laughs> um, going back, I was one of those high school punk kids that used to hang out at the free press in the early days. And um, you know, the times that they let me put a drawing or a layout or something in the issue, then uh, I get all the copies I could sell in the street, and which was nice, because um, you know I was a high school kid and I was broke. But uh, there were all kinds of fun things. There was the time we went out and did the um, first guerrilla theater in the area, and we all went in a truck dressed up like army soldiers uh, with these dummies we made out of rags dressed in black pajamas. And we were freaking people out when we were stabbing them with bayonets out in the mall and stuff. Um, but uh, talking about other underground papers, I just wanted to mention that kind of a predecessor to the Free Press was Tom DeBaggio's uh, newspaper called Underground. And the last issue of it was called The Independent. Um, he went on uh, to become kind of famous uh, writing about his uh, Alzheimer's. And he came out with a few books about it that really have become important uh, to people suffering from that. It, it's, it, it's a great grasp on it. Um, but there's just so many people that I run into online who've been involved with various things. And it all interconnects. And I think the big thing to consider is the fact that this is like the nexus of a community that spreads out all over the place. And I, I feel grateful that I got to know Art and Peter and everybody uh, that bit by bit, uh, that I met Marshall Bloom and I met, you know, um, Ray Mungo and those guys. And uh, even today, I'm, I'm, I'm still friends online with um, um, a few of them. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for everything. That's a great note to finish up on. Thank you, Ron. I would like to have a chance. Would, would the panelists like to say any final words, anything before we adjourn to the bar restaurant? Well, first of all, I wanted to say that that uh, Gorilla Theater you were talking about was in the Cherry Blossom Parade. That was kind of interesting for the tourists. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the newspaper, I think, well, our greatest achievement, we really haven't even talked about here, we spent many hours fleshing out the Washington Free Community. We had a, we had a, uh, a blueprint for transforming all of Washington, D.C. into a free community. And we spent a lot of energy, you know, saying, well, we need, we need free health care. We need uh, food for people that don't have any food. We need housing for people. And, and we were fleshing it all out and how they would interact and, and who would be on the board of directors and, and how it would get funded. And, 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 and this was a great, great uh, intellectual creation that we did. And, 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 we, and we only saw ourselves as one little microcosm of that Washington Free Community. We were the, the information nexus or whatever of, of the thing. And, and I think in a funny way, without realizing it, we kind of accomplished that in an informal way because we reached out into so many different directions that, that I, I, don't, I can't imagine Washington, D.C. being what it is today without the Washington Free Press. I think it was the beginning, opening salvo of people beginning to think for themselves, act for themselves, you know, and, and not waiting for the government to tell them what to do. So I, but I hope we can find a copy of that. Art and I were wondering last night if anybody still has a copy of all that. Uh, 
So if you do, please bring it forward because we want to see that again. Sure, of course. Um, I don't want to end this evening without mentioning uh, the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. Uh, I just uh, got back two weeks ago from Oakland, California, where 300 former comrades met, and uh, uh, some people I haven't seen in 45 years, but they, Frank just mentioned things, uh, community building, that uh, precisely that's what the Black Panthers were doing too. Yeah. Food, shelter, uh, uh, security in the neighborhood against uh, police brutality, and you know the whole program. But uh, it's it's nice that we had uh, this 50th anniversary of, of uh, both things uh, this year. It's been very nice. Was that any, anybody want to say a uh, final word? Um, uh, Art? I'm just touched by all the familiar faces and that have changed over the years that people have come. I just emotionally uh, moved by that, uh, the attendance of so many people I know here. I, I, I just have a few more words. To, yeah, I just want to thank, uh, I mentioned Dan Heinecker, who, th who uh, actually photographed every issue that was available, which um, will eventually be online. Uh, Jim True, who's also assisted in this in the back, um, uh, and, uh, preparing for today. Uh, what happened? Where's Jim, stand up. There he is. Okay. Yeah, Jim True. Yes. Um, uh, Davis White, who's uh, been recording this, which is, uh, you know, just huge help being able to document this. I'm very grateful that he was able to uh, be here to do that. Mark Greek, who's, uh, you know, with the MLK in Washingtoniana, and he, you know, secured us to be a part of this conference and uh, it is doing you know great things again it's all going to be digitized on dig dc uh, the historic the, the historic studies conference for letting us have this here um, mark seagraves with channel four if you haven't seen the uh, uh, art and pete were on nbc news last night and you can find them it's still up there online uh, he did an interview john kelly of course with the washington post who interviewed art and did a great piece earlier this week steve kiviat with the washington city paper Eddie Dean with Washingtoniana, Washingtonian, excuse me. Um, well, and uh, I mentioned Mark Obsosnik earlier. Jan Keskinen, who's been a great help to me um, through this and has dealt with uh, um, the extremes of my uh, mania. Um, and uh, of course, all the staffers uh, of the Washington Free Press, everybody who traveled here to be a part of this uh, really special day. Um, I'm very grateful for your participation and, of course, all of you staying here. We are going to go to this uh, bar right around the corner, uh, so everybody's welcome to that. Um, thank you, panelists. Uh, Dick Oaks, Frank Speltz, Mar Marjorie Stamberg, Bill Bloom, Pete Novick, a.k.a. Fuman Zybar, Judy Strother-Taylor, and Art Grossman. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, and thank you, Marty. Where are you, Marty and Art? You got, you know, this is a uh, thanks. Thanks again. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Happy, happy 50th anniversary. Uh,